Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Cole. I'm the Director of Collections Access here at the Filson Historical Society, and we're so glad you could join us this evening. Happy to introduce our speaker tonight, my colleague and friend, Dr. Abigail Glogauer, who's the Curator of Jewish Collections and the Jewish Community Archives here at the Filson. Since I'm sure that many or most of you heard Abby's formal education and professional background last week, we're mixing it up this week. Abby grew up in a large family in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She has five younger siblings and five nieces and nephews. She and her husband, Josh, spend a lot of their spare time fixing up their 1940s house in the Schmont neighborhood. Excuse me. They have two senior dogs, Emmett and Lucy, and some of Abby's favorite foods are avocados, tater tots, and really crunchy apples. Abby's really brought her passion for history and justice and a real zest to the Filson in the years she's been here. We are so lucky as an organization and as a community to have Abby with us here in Louisville. So I'm going to be turning the program over to Abby now and then we'll rejoin, <clears throat> I'll rejoin you after the presentation to moderate any questions as time permits. So thank you and now to Abby. Thank you so much, Jenny. Welcome back, everybody, for part two of Archiving Your Family History. Um, it is my pleasure to be back with you here again tonight. Um, I assigned some homework last week, and you still showed up, so that's great. Um, welcome back. Um, Emma is dropping a link in the chat to, for um, session one of uh, last week's program, in case you missed it. And as I get ready to share my screen, I just want to say big thanks, you know, the Zoom format, there are still a little uh, army of Filson staff making this whole thing run and it's really fabulous. So I really want to thank my colleagues for all their hard work um, making all this happen. I'm going to share my screen with you right now. And uh, we have so much ground to cover tonight, and we have a fabulous guest speaker who's going to inspire you um, and make you feel like you too can uh, approach and document your family history like an archivist. So I thought maybe what I would do is begin with just a little bit of review from last week. As I promised last week, Last week was going to be about some kind of big complicated concepts and then this week we were going to get a little more practical um, in, in nuts and bolts. So we'll do a teeny little bit of review highlights from last week, super fast. We talked about how family history is composed of different elements, right? We have genealogical background and information about who, what, where, when with your family. Um, but of course, family history is more than just genealogy. It's also memories and stories. And then it's also pictures and objects and papers, the stuff of history. And we talked about how you're going to have to kind of, to really do your family history, you have to get into all of these at once, like, the, like they're balls that you are juggling. And every family has their own different background, their own different amount of information and resources. So it's all kind of, there's no one size fits all. We talked about moving from a framework of saving to a framework of archiving. It's a, a paradigm shift, right? So we tend to save things in a way that's a little sentimental and haphazard and all over the place. Um, and in a way that also puts that historical material at risk. But we're trying to move more into a framework of archiving, really thinking about making that material organized, historical, intentional, and accessible. You want someone else to get something out of it. And so we're going to be talking a little more hands-on about how to do that tonight. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the characteristics and purposes of archival material. Um, archivists tend to privilege material that is unique, that documents daily life, that has enduring value because of the information that it contains, um, and that it is kept for the long term. 
And so why do we do this as individuals, as a society, as a set of uh, professionals? Um, we do this to provide long-term memory, history, and knowledge. We do this so that we have sources of understanding and identification about ourselves and our communities, and so that we're able to communicate values and information across time. So these are some of the things that you're trying to get yourself, the modes that you're entering as an archivist. Um, I'm bringing back the Drake meme, of course. Um, the big, one of the big takeaways, um, oops, uh, is that I really want people to think about that stuff is a burden, right? No, uh, nobody's kids want to deal with mountains and mountains, boxes of stuff. Um, and it's also makes that material very vulnerable, right? We talked about how if somebody opens up a storage unit and finds this and they don't have time to go through it, it's going pretty much straight into the trash, right? So stuff is hard to deal with, but an organized archive is a gift. Um, that's something that people really will want to treasure and learn from. And it has a lot to do with making that material accessible. And that's a big part of what archivists do, is take all this chaos and work to make it accessible. And so you're going to be doing some of that too, as you, to the extent that you see fit. Ultimately, last week, I challenged people who were interested in doing a little bit of light homework to think about how they want to put their spin on history, as I call it. Um, and spin is saving with purpose, intention, and narratives. So maybe some of you have even been thinking since last week a little bit about what kind of family history do I have access to? Um, why am I saving it and for whom? Um, and what am I going to do with it? And then more importantly, again, because we talked about you also have to play a little bit of the historian here, is to think a little bit outside yourself and outside your family. What stories does your history contain? And does it relate to? And, um, and some of that is going to come up tonight in a great way with our guest speaker. I'm really excited to extrapolate from that. So that gets us a little bit caught up. Um, and maybe if you've begun kind of surveying, thinking about what you have and how you're going to deal with it and save it and, you know, kind of work in some of that genealogy and some of those stories, I figured we would start off this week um, by going next into talking a little bit about what this work looks like for archivists. So again, remember last week I said part of this is for you, but part of it is also for us to explain the work we do a little bit better so that you can enact some of that um, in, your own, in your own work um, and to also maybe just get a little more excited about what we do. So I thought I would start off tonight talking about that move from chaos to order, um, roughly the archivist's path. And so what you're going to have to do if you're working on sorting through boxes of materials, um, we talked about it's a lot of work. And this is what we do. And it's kind of amazingly low tech, actually. The picture on the left is a picture from my own workspace at work. Um, and, you know, I don't, what sorting through materials, you don't even necessarily need, uh, you know, fancy equipment. You need a little bit of workspace and you need some time. Um, and so I, what we, the first work of, archi of the archival process is called processing. And this is kind of a, a blanket term that has a few different parts to it, but this basically refers to the work of assessing, arranging, and describing material that you have in your possession. And it doesn't necessarily happen overnight depending what kind of condition the materials are in, this could take a long process. Um, and so what you see on the left is a little bit of my process there. And then on the right is you see kind of a finished product 
these are actually two different collections, so it's a little bit of a lie. Um, we're almost done with the collection on the left, but not quite. So I had to cheat and use another question, uh, another picture. But it's really amazing what happens um, when you get things organized and tidied up and how official they look and also how inviting and appealing they look. The, 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 the box on the right where the material is sorted neatly into organized folders, I mean, you want to go to that. You want to open that. You want to go through that material. You want to access it. So that's part of what the big work of archiving is. So one of our big principles in the archival world is when order exists, we like to preserve it. We call that original order. Um, but where order does not exist, you'll have to create it. And that can be a lot of work, but it can also be really fun. The reason we like to preserve original order is Remember last week, we talked a little bit about the importance of archival context. And we're gonna talk about context some more tonight too. If someone in your family had saved, you know, materials in a scrapbook in a certain order, or they had saved family business records or something like that in a certain order, you wanna preserve that order because it lets us know how those records, how those materials were used and how their creator related to them. However, the reality amongst a lot of family history uh, stuff is that things get jumbled up over the decades as siblings and, and, and generations kind of trade things back and forth. An original order, if it ever existed, starts to disappear. So what you need to do is you sit down to process as you're assessing, you're also going to be arranging the material you're going to be figuring out, putting like with like, um, and creating some kind of order for that material. So for instance, an example might be, say your family belonged for many years to a particular church and had saved things related to their involvement in that church. Um, if you decide to keep that material and it's spread out, that might go together. But then if they switch to another church later on, maybe that's a different folder of material. You have to try to look for opportunities, whether they're chronological or thematic um, or by individual family member, where you can exert order where there isn't any. And the fancy schmancy high tech way that archivists do this is by putting things into piles. I'm absolutely serious. We put them into piles and we get them sorted into folders and you kind of work in stages. You're gonna work through your material to get it roughly sorted. And then you can go into each folder later on and really get it into better order if you want, which is what we did in the collection on the right, a wonderful family collection. This was a family of letter writers. They wrote a lot of letters um, and the letters start in the, the 1920s and they go up all the way um, through all through the 20th century. And so we were able to then get all those orders in uh, letters in order, labeled in folders. You don't have to use a label machine. In fact, I'm actually, I prefer handwriting on the folders. Um, even though I have very poor handwriting, you don't have a label that could fall off later. So a plain old pencil is absolutely great. So think about it's okay. This is a process. It takes a little while. And one piece of advice I have is when you sit down and work on this, try to set up a workspace for yourself. Don't push yourself to the brink of exhaustion and frustration. Work on it in pieces and you wanna get up and move away from it while you're feeling good so that you'll want to come back to it another time. It's the same philosophy I adopted when I was writing my dissertation. I always wanted to end my daily writing on a good note, feeling good about my work, not feeling frustrated or exhausted. So as you work through um, getting your materials sorted and you're gonna be culling them, you're gonna be throwing away duplicates of things, you're gonna be throwing away things that maybe have, you know, 
more sentimental value than informational value. Remember, we talked about the potato chips and soda versus the, um, the healthy balanced meal full of nutrition. By all means, I would never deprive you of ever having chips and soda. Keep some of those sentimental things, but you don't necessarily have to keep all of them. We want information and we want context. So I had originally planned to share with, to go on our website and share with you this amazing thing that archivists make called finding aids. Um, instead, what we're gonna do, Emma's gonna drop a link into the chat and we will follow it up in our email because it's a little hard to navigate through. But I wanna introduce you to a fantastic thing that archivists make as they're arranging, after they get their material um, in the collection arranged uh, uh, and sorted and um, described, get it into these little folders. Then we do some of this description work. We create something called a finding aid. And a finding aid is a way of capturing some of the context and the contents of uh, a historical collection. And it's, think of it a little bit like a roadmap and a table of contents, if you will. And a, a, a finding aid is a document. You do not need to be a gifted writer to produce this basic kind of inventory. What the finding aid is, is a document that lives in the collection with the material. And it basically provides a list of what's in each box and what's in each folder. Again, this is going to be different for everybody because everybody's family history is different. But there's also space in the very beginning of the finding aid to write a collection overview. And this is some of the intellectual labor that archivists do is they basically write a few paragraphs. This is what's in this collection. This collection is you know, Joe so-and-so's collection of World War II letters that he wrote home to his wife and kids when he was stationed in blah, blah, blah. And you can write a, a, a note about the contents and also biographical information as well. The who, what, where, when, why about the family. Um, and so I've inserted down here a little pro tip. Again, I'm not gonna link to this, but if you have a Louisville Free Public Library card, you have a gold mine in your wallet for being able to do some research on filling in that information about your family history. And archivists use these resources all the time. We, you can use Ancestry.com for free through the Louisville Free Public Library. And you can also access the historical um, database of the Courier Journal that goes all the way back to 1830. So when we are re when we are working on family collections that we have gotten sorted, I mean not just family collections, business collections, organizations as well, there is work that needs to be done to do some basic research. And so a lot of times we end up going to census um, reports in Ancestry.com. Also on Ancestry, we use old city directories to find out where businesses and residences and organizations were located. You can access that too. And you can also do searching in the Courier Journal to see if there was any news mentions about anyone in your family or any of the organizations that they were involved with. So it's very time uh, and labor intensive. If you're interested in that, you go to the LFPL homepage and you click on research tools in the upper left and then you scroll down to databases. There's a whole database with um, genealogical resources. So you can use the same tools that archivists use included um, with the tax money that we pay to support our wonderful free public library. So finding aids are a way to really start thinking about the big picture of your family history. Um, and so I'm gonna encourage everyone to peruse some of those on our website and think a little bit about what a finding aid for your family history 
might look like. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some basics of storage and preservation. But before we do, I think this is an opportunity as we're talking about finding aids to also return to this question of narratives and stories. What kind of stories are you going to be extracting from your history? And you might find if you have family history materials, those might tell you a little bit about what some of the stories are. Listen to your sources. This is one of the golden rules of, um, of being a historian also, is listen to what the sources have to tell you. If there are any newspaper clippings, if there are any stories that have been passed down to you, think about those stories. Um, and think also, I wanna challenge everyone here, and I, we will come back to this in the Q&A because I got an advanced question about this that was so good that I really want to talk about it more. But I want to challenge everyone to be thinking about what narratives in your family history are you choosing to emphasize and which ones are you also choosing to de-emphasize, right? Human beings, we are storytellers. That is how we make sense of our world. And we are also generally creatures of comfort. We are drawn to things that make us feel better and we are reticent to deal with things that make us feel less good. So I want everyone to be aware of all of the many subtle ways that people influence and sometimes unintentionally censor history simply by choosing to focus on some parts of family history and ignoring others. Um, and I really want to uh, trouble that and kind of remind people that history is complicated and sometimes it's difficult and painful. Um, and as a historian, you know, I feel that it's our responsibility to engage in that. I didn't become a historian because I thought it was fun. It's actually very painful. And sometimes history makes me cry. So if there are difficult things in your family history and your instinct is to dismiss those and cover them um, and ignore them, I'm gonna ask you to just press pause on those feelings and try to sit with them and ask some questions about that because there might be a lot to learn there, both for you and for other people as well. So with that kind of existential aside, we'll talk a little bit about storage and preservation because I know this is really um, important. You'll recognize this picture from last week. It was a picture of nice, beautiful, clean archival storage. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the big picture golden rules for storage and housing. Um, I, I think of them as stability and integrity. So storage is where you're keeping your stuff. And housing refers to what the stuff is kept in. Um, so the storage is the facility and the shelves and the kind of conditions of that room. And then the housing is the boxes and the folders that these things are in. So I'm going to tell you something. Your stuff is a lot like us. It wants to be comfortable. <laughs> so if you think about, we as humans put a lot of resources into stabilizing our own living environment and to kind of maintain the integrity of, of our bodies within that environment. So unfortunately, we relegate our stuff to parts of our houses where there's a lot less stability and therefore a lot less uh, opportunity for integrity. So whereas we keep our living areas um, a pretty standard kind of temperature between the heating and the air conditioning, depending on the seasons. We also try to regulate our humidity. Um, that's not the case for the parts of the house where people are most likely to store their history, like the attic where things get very hot and dry and stuffy, or the basement where things get kind of wet and humid, or the garage where they'll get some of everything. These are not stable um, environments. So remember, I want to close the loop a little bit thinking again about 
you know, archivists have to make tough choices when you realize how much work goes into actually saving something in an environment that is um, stable and has integrity, uh, suddenly space gets a whole lot more limited. Um, and so it's really worth thinking about. So what are we protecting from? Um, and this is kind of just a little bit of an overview here. Um, and uh, let's see, let me just pop up on the screen. I'm gonna put it down. So I generally don't like to speak in such combative terms, but you know, these are some of the enemies of archival preservation. Um, things that compromise the stability and the integrity of archival materials. We want to be able to protect our stuff from dust and dirt, pests like bugs and mice. Um, we want to protect things from light exposure because light is going to, you know, make things brittle or faded. Humidity and moisture is a big one. I am currently storing things in my basement, which I don't feel great about, but I made sure to prioritize getting a dehumidifier that runs constantly in my basement um, to try to keep the moisture levels down. Um, we wanna protect against fluctuations in the environment. So again, um, think about a, a pantry or a closet in your house is going to be a lot more stable in terms of the temperature and humidity fluctuation than your garage or your basement. Um, and it's also going to be more protective than for things like mold and mildew. Once things get moldy and mildewy, it's really, really hard to save them. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, people bring us things at the Filson that were very cool, but they're so destroyed from improper care that not only is it hard for us to you know, read them and use them, they also present a danger to put in our collections because they could transfer some of that to other materials. Gravity and stress, I think, refers to thinking about how those things are stacked and stored. Are things rolled up? Are, they, are the corners crunched? Are they kind of perched precariously um, in a way where they could be warping? Um, those are all things that you want to be aware of. Um, and I have a little tip here. Again, if it's really worth saving, it's probably worth preserving and taking care of. So I'm not going to go on the internet right now because I want to get to our guest speaker, but I put Gaylord.com up there, which is our website where we at the Filson purchase our archival supplies. Um, it'll be, if you're really serious about this, spend some time on there. It's a fun place to shop. And you might be a little shocked uh, with a uh, sticker shock. That's the term. Um, these materials are expensive because they're also designed to be acid free so that there's nothing in the housing that is going to leach or do anything to damage the material as well. So if you're feeling fancy, you could go on Gaylord.com and you could, you could drop $300 in just a couple minutes on coming up with wonderful housing to store your family records. But don't feel like you have to. Personally, I don't have any of that money sitting around handy. So a lower cost version of doing some preservation work might be thinking about, well, is there any stuff that I could get out of the garage and sort through and then move into a closet in my house where it's going to be a little bit more protected? Um, there are lots of different cost solutions as well based on your budget. And again, that keeping an eye on the preservation is really what we're going for. So those are some of the big pictures of the pragmatics I wanted to take us through today about how to think about approaching your material and processing it, how to supplement that and engage that with research that you can do um, through databases, through talking with other people that you know, and how to start enacting um, some description of the narratives and the stories that you have and to your materials. 
So what I'm going to do now, I promised one of the highlights of this evening is I was going to introduce you to somebody I know who has been doing this work for a couple years. Um, and so I had gotten in, uh, in touch with Kenneth Grossman uh, a few years ago, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about his family history, his journey working with this history, and the narratives and the material that he's been working with. So Kenneth Grossman is a master custom clothier and the founder of Executive Image Clothiers here in Louisville, um, a, a trade that, as you will see, is descended very much of the family history he's going to be telling us about. So I'm going to turn things over to my friend, Kenneth Grossman. Hi, Ken. Hey, Abby. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank Abby and the Filson. Um, without their inspiration, I'm not sure that I would have gotten my project done. And uh, Abby is remarkable. She's an inspiration. And um, uh, uh, this workshop's been wonderful. And so I just want to tell a little bit about my process and what I went through to preserve my family's history. And I first want to mention my brother, Phil, who uh, Phil is a uh, prominent plaintiff's attorney in town, firm at Grossman and Green. And Phil and I grew up with uh, Loving Hearts. And uh, my dad, as we were kids, was always showing us uh, a lot of history. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a rich history. Our store was in business. Actually, it started in Lexington in 1867 and uh, continued through a couple, uh, gener a couple different uh, phases. And we closed the store at Oxmoor Center in 1996. So it was in business, we were in business for 129 years. And uh, first I wanna get this off the table. Uh, people ask me, Grossman, why the name Loving Hearts? Where did that come from? And um, when you look at the lineage, uh, Lee Loving Heart was my uh, great grandfather. My father's mother, Pauline Loving Heart, married H. Philip Grossman. And that's how it came into the hands of the Grossman family. So, um, so what was my challenge? Um, when my parents, uh, I grew up in Devondale, and a lot of you are familiar with that neighborhood in the East End, and my parents lived in the house for 50 years, and uh, they had a lot of stuff in the basement. And uh, so when they left their home in Devondale in 2015, uh, Dad gave me uh, eight albums, stock certificates, uh, board mitts, and uh, all the old ads from Love and Hearts at Oxmoor. And the information, I was fortunate the information was organized. However, uh, I wanted to preserve it for future generations. I didn't want it just to sit in my basement and then eventually give it to my kids, have it sit in their basement, and then potentially just get thrown out. So. I wanted to create a legacy and, and save this history that's uh, precious to, to myself and my brother and, and our family. So um, the first challenge was I never made a photo album using today's technology of scanning photos and taking or even taking digital photos and putting them into an album. So I was a little intimidated by that. And I was intimidated just with the scope of the whole project and the technology. And uh, like, like all of us, I'm busy. Uh, I've got my custom clothing business. My parents, uh, my mom unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. My dad's 91, but we were taking care of my parents. And uh, I have my own family. I've got two boys that are, one's finished college and another is now at uh, University of Alabama. So like everybody, I was busy. So um, in 2017, uh, I met Abby, and uh, so obviously I'm going back three years ago. It took me a while to get around to doing this, but uh, I met Abby at my mom and dad's condo at the Glenview, and I brought all the books and all the history, and the goal was to organize and preserve the history, and then we were going to donate the original documents to the Filson Archives. And uh, Abby was inspirational. And her fascination with my family story was, um, was, was very helpful. 
So my first attempt at it, I hired a uh, University of Louisville college intern who was remarkable. And we started scanning all the pictures and I was going to have her help to organize all this. And she was remarkable, but uh, quite frankly, I wasn't. Uh, we never complete project and it kind of fell on the back burner. And uh, I decided if I was ever going to do this, I was going to have to do this myself. So in 2020, two things happened. Uh, one is very obvious, the COVID. Uh, I found I had a little bit more time on my hands. I wasn't quite as busy as my family had, had matured. And uh, my custom clothing business, uh, all of a sudden, for some reason, guys weren't going anywhere and, and there wasn't a whole lot of, a whole lot of need. So uh, I found I had more time on my hands, but then there also, there was a tragedy that happened to uh, 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 not a member of the family, but, a, but an honorary member of the family. Uh, there was a gentleman who was a part of our store. He was a vice president. His name is uh, Larry Skip Ford. He worked at our store for 40 years. And prior to that, his father worked at our store for 40 years. So between the two of them, they had 80 years invested in Love and Hearts. And I really had intentions of getting this done before Skip, uh, oh, Skip was alive. But unfortunately, Skip was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain tumor in early August. And he passed away three weeks later, and um, so I didn't I didn't accomplish that, and uh, I'll I'll never forgive myself for that. And uh, so my advice to you, if this is something you're thinking about doing, uh, don't procrastinate. Uh, go ahead, go ahead and do it. You'll you'll be glad that you did. So how did I get started? I did a simple Google search, and uh, I found there was a website called Blurb. Abby was familiar with it when I mentioned it to her. And it's a great site for creating a book. You can kind of see images of the book that I was able to create uh, on the screen right now. And uh, I found it was really easy. I just, I've got a, 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 a printer that scans. I took the, uh, the pictures and documents and I was able to scan them right off the printer and insert them into the book. So uh, I always told folks once I get started on this, I probably won't be able to stop and that's exactly what happened because I did most of it in 72 hours over a long weekend. And like I said in the beginning, I was, I was fortunate. I didn't have to go to the library or go dig information from a lot of other sources. It was all there. It just wasn't in a, in a format that, that, uh, that I was gonna be able to use uh, to, to put it into these, into these photo albums. So uh, the essence of the book I completed uh, in August and then it, I've, ordered two prototype books. Now I've got seven books on order for family. We're gonna also, Phil and I are gonna donate a book to the Filson. We're gonna donate a book to the Temple Archives and um, we'll have something um, that hopefully will last into perpetuity. So the final product, uh, I like to say, it, 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 just, it just gives me a great sense of pride that I've been able to preserve the, our family history uh, I was very concerned that it would just get lost. And one of the neat things I can do, having used the website I use, is I, I can, I have a PDF of the whole book and I can send that to anybody who's interested in the book and wants to see it, but I can't actually show, physically show them the book. So that's been very nice. Another thing that I recently did is I took some of the scanned pictures and put a Facebook post out with about 10 of the pictures. And uh, it, uh, I guess it almost went viral. I re reconnected with a lot of people who had been customers of the store. So one individual whose family, their father was a vice president in the business that I'd lost touch with. And uh, it was just really gratifying to see the result, the, the uh, response to, the, to that Facebook post. So I have another project that I'm working on. Uh, Love and Hearts was in business from 1971 to 1996 at Oxmoor Center. And we've got about seven photo albums that I need to archive and organize and, and uh, edit. And I'm gonna create an, another album uh, from, from that uh, for the o Oxmoor store. So I'd like to just in a few minutes, just take you through some of the album and uh, give you an idea of what the final, final product is. So, um, uh, this is the second page of the book. 
Um, it is the story of Henry and Lee Lovenhart. And just real brief, uh, it's a great immigrant story. Uh, Henry and Lee came from, um, from Wolfhausen, Germany. Their father was a merchant in Germany. He passed away and the mother brought them to the United States in 1951. They were eight and 11 years old. The mother died on the trip, so they were orphans in a new land, and they had an uncle who took them in in Cincinnati. Uh, but from very humble beginnings, uh, uh, they were able to create quite a business. So they were peddlers for many years, and uh, then in 1867, Lee Lovenhart, my great-grandfather, and his brother Henry opened a business in Lexington, which survived until 1922, which was when uh, Henry Lovenhart passed away. And in, in 1898, uh, Lee Lovenhart had three sons and a daughter, and they decided the business wasn't big enough for both families. So he opened Lovenhart's in Louisville in 1898. It's the corner of Third Market, uh, it's across from the Levy Brothers building, the spaghetti factory. Now it's, it's now actually uh, part of our com downtown convention center. And that was the original store. The picture on top um, is the original store. If you look, it's hard to see it in this picture, but uh, Lee Lovenhart is standing all the way on the right. And he, when, you take, when, the, when you see the picture, you can see he's kind of looking like, okay, that's enough of the picture. I want to go back to work. And the gentlemen that are standing there in front of the store were key employees that my father could actually name. My, my dad is 91 and uh, living in an assisted living facility. And so one of the things I'm very happy about is I was able to get this done before, uh, while he was still alive. And then lastly in this picture, well, you can also see it here. Um, they, that was the first ad, open today, you're invited. Love and Hearts in German translate into lion hearted. So the lion and the heart were always part of our image. And um, the ad's kind of a very folksy kind of kind of ad that uh, was the, the way things were written in those days. And on the next slide, on the next slide, this, believe it or not, back in 1898, they actually had direct mail. We're supposedly having trouble with our post office these days but uh, uh, they were able to send that mailer out. And I love what they said in the mailer. I mean, it just says it all. Best goods at any price, lowest price on any goods, no trash at any price. And that's what you got at Love and Hearts. And then there were actually fabrics in the mailer. Those are cashmere suits that you could get for $5 or seven fifty dollars for the really nice ones. So uh, you can't get those values today. This is Love and Hearts um, around 1930. Um, and that's how I remember the store downtown. And Love and Hearts had many firsts. The little image on the left, uh, we had the first delivery by airplane in store in Louisville. Uh, they delivered uh, society brand suits to our store in 1917. Uh, we we're very proud that uh, in, the, in the late 1960s, uh, my father hired an African-American tailor, and uh, it was kind of unheard of then to, uh, to have a, a tailor uh, like that. So, uh, that. That's a proud heritage. So go on to the next slide. Those are my uncles. Uh, Percy and uh, Uncle Edgar. I love the picture at the bottom. Edgar Lovenhart was actually by training an en engineer, and uh, that's him working on the Panama Canal, was a bottle of wine, and uh, he came into the store later, and uh, my dad had three uncles who were involved in the business. These are a couple of the windows from uh, the third street side of the store in the 1960s, and you can see they were just really well decked out, well thought out, beautiful windows, part of the elegance of the time. And then lastly, uh, with my brother Phil's help, we were able to put together this Lovenhart Grossman family tree. 
And uh, it goes back seven generations to my great, great, great grandfather, Herbst Lohenherz, who was born in Wolfenhausen, Germany in 1807. So um, it's a great history. I'm proud to share it with you. And um, I will be available for questions afterwards if you have any that you want to put in the chat. And at this point, I want to again thank Abby and turn the meeting back over to her. Thank you so much, Kenneth Grossman. I concluded here with a little before and after picture. There's so much more great material in there. Now, if anyone out there like is feeling a little bit like what I feel when I look at the Levenhart and Grossman history, I think, wow, I don't, my family didn't have a store. We didn't have all those great photographs. My gosh, <laughs> he's published a book. It's not possible. I can never do it. It's okay. Everyone has their own family history and whether you have a store or you have some other kind of story, you're going to do what you can with what you have. I really want to point out a couple really exciting things that I get out of Ken's presentation. One is we see the multi-generational work. This is a collaboration. His family worked on keeping things well organized and passing them down to him in an organized and controlled manner so that he was then able to take the next step, which was compiling them further into a narrative story, a storybook that he could then produce um, for his own family. Um, and so that's a really interesting thing, again, thinking about those stages of work. And I also want to point out all the ways that this story connects to other stories. This family story is also part of the story of um, the American garment industry, the landscape of American department stores, of downtown Louisville, of, of tailors and salespeople um, who worked in that store and shopped in that store advertising, the economy, all kinds of things. So it's a really wonderful, rich history. It's multivalent. It can be approached from a lot of different directions. And that is really what I want everyone to be thinking about as they put on their archivist hats and their historian hats. So I'm gonna conclude. I have a few concluding thoughts. And again, this is just the beginning of your journey, not the end. So like, Kenneth reminded us, there's no time like the present, right? Don't wait around until you're gone. You have so much information that lives in you. Um, don't delay. Uh, this is a process and it's gonna take time and that's okay. You can ask for help um, from archivists, from family members. We talked a little bit about this last week too, Come, teaming up with family members or friends who are working on this too. Think of this not just as a chore, something you have to do, but an opportunity to learn about your history and to maybe learn about aspects of history you hadn't considered before. Remember that any work you do is better than no work at all, right? So even if you don't produce a blurb book, although that's a very cool thing, even getting your material more organized so that your another generation could produce the blurb book is a great thing as well. And finally, the future thanks you for the work that you're going to do right now. And I got the tiny potato meme in there. The tiny potato says, I believe in you. You can do the thing. Um, my email is there as well. And I'm going to unshare my screen now so we can do questions. Um, all right, so hopefully we're back to uh, regular regular screen. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Abby. That was great. So much information. Thanks, Ken, also. It was really interesting to hear your personal journey with family archives. Um, and we had a couple questions in the chat about what resource Ken used to publish the book. And I think it was blurb. Is that correct, Abby? Blurb? Okay, well, that's what we put in the link um, for anyone who had that question. Um, Abby, 
a few people have asked questions about digitizing their family archives and I wrote back in the chat that I didn't really think we were going to cover that specifically tonight, but sent a couple of resources, but do you have any thoughts about self digitizing one's family archives. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. And we talked a little bit about this last week also. Remember, there was a slide up called, you know, digitizing is not archiving. So you could scan, you know, 500 pictures and then you have 500 digital files. Well, you know, what are you going to do with those, right? And we talked about how digital material is actually really kind of vulnerable. So there's going to be a kind of culling and selection process, no matter how you slice it. So I know, you know, and, and Ken can talk about this a little bit more, not everything in those original materials made it into his blurb book. The blurb book was to kind of create a curated little sampling of it. Um, for for his family. Um, so I just try to remind people that the, the goal, whether you're digitizing or working with analog materials, the goal is again being really intentional about what you want to what you want to save and why and what you plan to do with it. Um, so don't just digitize everything for the sake of digitizing it. Think about how you're digitizing it and what you want to do with it um, and what kind of contextual information you're going to create around it. Because if you don't do that work, you've just kind of wasted a lot of time on digitizing, if that helps at all. Thanks, Abby. Um, another question that came up in chat um, is how do you get younger people interested? in caring about family history. And I know that's something we hear a lot when someone brings in their records. My kids don't care. My grandkids don't care. Do you have any strategies on that? I saw that question come up in the chat and I got excited about it because I think about this a lot. Something that I think is really important for us to remember, and this, this came up last week a little bit, we are all individual human beings on our own unique timelines with our different personalities. So one thing to consider is that in every family, there are always going to be a couple family members who are more innately interested in learning and preserving family history than others. And that's okay. That's just kind of how we are, right? Some people are really into sports and I'm not one of them, right? So <laughs> it's okay, different strokes for different folks. So that's one thing to remember is that some people are always more interested in it than others. Another thing to remember is that we're on different timelines. And just because somebody is not interested in something in their youth, does not mean that they won't be interested in it later on. And I, you know, I turned 40 recently. I am now in middle age. I don't know how that happened, but I understand the things that I care about now and the questions, the things that I'm curious about now are very different from what I, what motivated me when I was you know, under 30. So I think we also need to be a little patient and forgiving and understand that some of this has to do with developmental stuff, life stages of where people are. Um, so part of, I guess I'm answering your question by saying, don't worry about it if people under 30 are not interested in it just yet. <laughs> because maybe they will be later on. But I also think that one of the keys is, again, finding a way to bring people into that history and pointing to some boxes of disorganized chaos <laughs> in a garage is not inviting, it's not accessible, it's not gonna do it for them. Um, and so again, front loading some of that work and letting your kids know or your grandkids know, hey, you might not be ready for this right now, but whenever you are, look at this treasure trove of stuff that your family has put together that really helps give a story about where you come from and some of the things your family has lived through. Your kids might not be innately interested in the family history, but maybe they're interested in other topics of history that your family history connects to. So you might want to try finding some other ways in. 
Thanks, Abby. There's another question that I think maybe sort of could tie in with what you were hoping to be able to talk about regarding what you prioritize and not. And this question um, specifically is about how you find a balance in providing documentation of genealogical information, but also keeping a narrative readable and flowing. Um, that may segue nicely into the other question you were mentioning. I do want to say this is probably one of our last questions because we're getting really close to the end of time. Thanks. Gotcha. Okay. So I'll tie it in with, you know, something that, you know, I've heard, which is, I'm not a writer. How can I write my family history? I can't write a book, right? So again, this question of information versus narrative. There is not one perfect answer to this. We're all different. And again, employing that strategy of anything you can do is better than nothing. So if you're getting bogged down in endless genealogical research and it's so exhausting that you're not telling any of the story, then maybe you might want to bring things into balance. Notice how at the back of Ken's book, he included that family tree. That did not include every Grossman and every Levenhart that ever lived, right? What he did was help he condensed the family history a little bit as it related to that story of the store. And it kind of comes down to the present generation. So that's an example of finding a little bit of balance, right? Um, and trying to figure out the people who, and the stories that you're interested in and weaving some of that factual information in without you know, letting that factual information become an obsessive thing that you're completely focused on because we don't want to lose those stories. And in fact, Ken knows after we, we talked about this a little bit, I said, well, you and your brother have all these great stories from growing up in the store. How are you going to get those? And we talked about one possibility is they just sit down one night and open a bottle of wine or bourbon and turn on a recorder on their phone and share some of those stories. And then you can get them typed up and transcribed. And then you can add that to your collection and to your finding aid. Um, you don't have to be an author um, to just get some stories down any old way that you can. Um, and talking with someone who knows you and you can share stuff with might be a really good way to do that. That's great. Thanks, Abby. Well, I think we're right on the dot at seven o'clock. So thanks to everyone for the excellent um, participation tonight, the great questions. If anyone didn't get their question answered, I'm so sorry. Abby's email is in the chat. Ken's email is in the chat. It's also Abby's anyway. It's on the Filson's website. So please feel free to reach out to any of us and we're happy to work with you. And thanks so much for joining us tonight at the Filson. Thanks, Abby. Great. Thank you all. Good night. Good luck. <laughs>